reactions in aqueous solution. So we're going to revisit, as I said, um, double displacement reactions. So two outcomes can occur as a result of mixing two aqueous ionic com compounds together. Okay, so similar to a double displacement reaction. The comp compounds will remain in solution without reacting. So what happens is if both of the um, uh, solutions are soluble in water, right, they will dissociate and you really wouldn't see anything, right? So we saw one of the double displacement reactions in one of our labs way back when that we really saw no reaction occurring, right? So, um, so, bo so both ionic compounds actually I um, ionized, okay, dissociated within the water. And the other thing, one aqueous ionic compound will chemically react with the other. So we'll be seeing um, the idea of either a precipitate forming, as in uh, several double displaced reactions. We're also going to see how gases can be formed in um, these double displacement reactions. So there are a few types of reactions that you're going to have to remember. And there are a few tips to identifying these uh, types of reactions, and you're going to have to memorize some of them. So let's recall the double displacement reaction where the metals of two different compounds exchange places, metals only replace metals and the non-metals, okay? So you can treat it as one or the other. The metal will replace the other metal, or you can just switch the two non-metals with one another, okay? So imagine here, all right, we've got our metal, always followed with our non-metal, metal followed by a non-metal. So, we're going to rewrite them the same way and watch the switch that's occurring, right? So we can either switch the metals or we can switch the non-metals. doesn't really matter. The order in which we write these, okay, if I want, I can write this one first. doesn't really matter. But always make sure that you're always writing your metal first. So possible evidence of a double displacement reaction include formation of a precipitate so that ions are removed from solution as an insoluble solid. Okay, so the, the idea of a precipitate, we're looking at a solid that will not dissolve in an aqueous solution, will not dissolve in the water. Formation of a gas so that the ions are removed from solution in a form of a gaseous product, oftentimes uh, with these reactions, these are double displacement reactions that appear as double displacement reactions, but include an extra decomposition reaction, right? So one of the, uh, the, the uh, compounds, one of the products, actually further decomposes into uh, a gas. And the last one here, formation of water, so that the uh, hydrogen ions and the hydroxide ions are removed from solution as water. Common one, right? Neutralization reactions, formation of water. So double displacement reactions that form precipitates. These type of, types of reactions are also known as precipitate reactions. Don't worry about um, naming it as a different type of reaction. It's double displacement. But another way we can explain these double displacement reactions is to call it a precipitate reaction. But don't worry, just keep it as double displacement reaction. Identify the state of the products of the following reaction. So we have the following. Uh, lead to nitrate plus potassium iodide. And I've already kind of completed the, um, the switch, right? So the lead and uh, the uh, nitrate, the uh, potassium and the iodide. So notice how the metal, okay, switch places with one another. Now, we know that they're both in aqueous solution. So, we have to identify which one will remain as aqueous, which one will remain as solid. To do that, you need the solubility table. So, let's look at the, uh, the following. So, we, we're looking at uh, K in, the, um, in our guideline. And here's K, right? What do we say? K is soluble, so it's soluble. Nitrate, what do we say about nitrate? Also soluble. So if the two are soluble, obviously this whole compound is soluble. 
But not only that, right? What happened would have been if one of them was insoluble? Well, the next step would be to look at the guideline. The higher the guideline, that's the one that's going to overpower any of the lower guidelines. But since they're both in guideline number one, right, didn't really matter, right? So if we had something else in here with nitrate, it would have, the nitrate still would have overpowered whatever the other guideline would have been if it included any one of these lower ones. So we know it's soluble, so because they're soluble, they will actually dissociate in water, right? So they will separate into your potassiums and your nitrate ions and allow the water to surround it. So because they're soluble, the state in which they're in is aqueous. Let's look at the next one. PB and iodine. So let's look for uh, PB. Here's PB. So PB says we're insoluble. Iodide is right here. And it says it's soluble. So now we have one that's soluble, one that's insoluble. The next thing to look for is the guideline. So lead belongs to guideline number two. And iodide belongs here to guideline number three. So the higher up that we are in the guideline, that's what's going to overpower the entire, or pretty much offset the lower one. So because the higher guideline is, is two, two says we're insoluble, this one is what's going to precipitate. So in this reaction, right, the precipitate that we're going to form in our solution, so we're going to have our solution, or our, our final product, and we're going to have the precipitate forming. That precipitate that's forming here is the PbI2, the lead to iodide. So you got to use the, um, the, the solubility uh, guidelines to solve these types of double displacement reactions. So let's look at uh, these sample problems. Which of the following pairs of aqueous solutions produces a precipitate? Write a balanced chemical equation if you predict a precipitate. Write N NR, so no reaction, if you predict that no reaction will take place. So take a moment to look at these. And all I've given here are the initial reactants. So write out your reactants. Write out your uh, products. Figure out what your products are going to be. Balance it. And then figure out which one will precipitate out. This is what your initial products should look like. K2CO3, it's an aqueous solution. So your copper 2 sulfate, um, CuSO4, also aqueous solution. When we mix them together, when we mix them together, we know that here's the metal, here's the non-metal. Here's the metal, here's the non-metal. And we know that when we put these together, we're going to have uh, potassium is going to combine with the sulfate, right? And the copper with the carbonate. So we'll have K2, uh, what is it, SO4. We don't know if it's aqueous yet, right? Plus, so we're going to put, we're just going to put little brackets there just so we can uh, designate it in a second. We have the copper 2 that is going to combine with the carbonate, so CuCO3, and you all know how these formulas come together, right? You need to know. This is not the time to review that last time. So, to do that, to identify what state that they're in, which one is actually going to, you know, break apart, okay, dissociate in, in solution, which is actually going to remain solid, if any, right? So, we need the solubility chart. So, we've got K, right, potassium, guideline one, soluble. Soluble, and it's guideline one. Sulfate is over here, 
also soluble. Because they are both soluble, and this one's guideline number five, it doesn't really matter what guideline they're in, if they're both soluble. Right? I, I wrote them down just so you guys can see it. But if, if you see that they're both soluble, for, who cares? We know that they're soluble. So what is the, uh, the state that they're in? Aqueous, right? Aqueous. Now, let's look at the next one. Cu, right? Here it is. So Cu is uh, soluble, and it's in guideline number five. Carbonate is over here, and it's insoluble. So which is going to overpower which? Well, carbonate is part of guideline number two. So the higher of the two guidelines is what's going to determine the solubility of that ionic compound. So will that dissolve? No, no it will not. So the state is? Solid. We will we'll see those. We'll see those. But technically, what, what is a liquid? Which one is the liquid? The aqueous, right? Because remember, if, if we see a precipitate forming, Right? We'll still have our, our entire solution, but we're going to have that kind of chalky material that's kinda, that cannot dissolve in that aqueous solution, that will not dissociate in water. Now, let's look at um, the next example here. Ammonium chloride and zinc sulfate. So we know here, here's the ammonium, the metal, non-metal. Metal, non-metal. Non when we put these together, Right? The ammonium is going to combine with the sulfate, and we're going to get NH4 to SO4. Right? We don't know if oops, we don't know what uh, what it'll be if it will dissolve. We've got then zinc right, with uh, the chloride, and again, same thing. We don't know. Um, which one is actually going to precipitate out. Now, we look for ammonium. So let me just clear off some of this chart here so we can see it. So we clear off. So ammonium, we look for ammonium, and uh, we have ammonium right here, and it's soluble. Let me use a different color. So soluble, and it's guideline number one. We look for sulfate. Sulfate is down here. Also soluble. So because it's soluble, and guideline five, soluble, soluble, aqueous. Zinc chloride. So we've got zinc down here, soluble, and it's guideline number five. We've got chloride here which is guideline number three, which is also soluble, so aqueous. So will we see anything precipitate? No. No. So technically, no reaction. So you want to do the work on the side so you don't have to really put, put out the rest of that equation and then have to cross it out. So you write down that it's no reaction. So you're not really going to see it. So what you're going to see is just the two liquids, right? The two aqueous solutions mixed together, and they're just going to remain mixed together, right? They're all going to dissociate within the solution. So technically, according to precipitate reactions, we would state that there's no reaction. But technically, yes, there is that it. combination, but we never really see it because they're not really together because they break apart to be surrounded by molecules of whatever the solvent is, which is usually water. Double displacement reactions that produce a gas. If you have these, the solubility chart is unimportant. So we're not going to use it for uh, such equations. So gases produced include hydrogen. So it will produce hydrogen gas. Hydrogen sulfide, which is a poisonous gas that smells like rotten eggs. Uh, sulfur dioxide, which is a reactant in forming acid rain. Carbon dioxide. We know what carbon dioxide is. And ammonia. So these are five different types of gases that we can produce in double displacement reactions. Now, when we produce these, a lot of times there's 
an additional component, right? Remember we said in double displacement reactions, two reactants form two products. But sometimes we'll see two reactants and three products. The reason for the three products is the double displacement reaction has taken place, but sometimes one of the products further breaks down. It's unstable in the way it is and will continue to decompose further. And we'll see that. And these are some of the equations that you're going to, um, or types of reactions you're going to need to memorize. Let's see the uh, first one. Double displacement reactions that produces hydrogen gas. Alkaline metals form bonds with hydrogen to produce compounds called uh, hydrides. So let's look at uh, hydrides now. Hydrides react with water to produce hydrogen gas. This is one of the tricky ones um, that you've been asked in the past to, uh, to identify what the products are. And it's not as clear cut, but now here's one thing that you're going to want to be able to identify. What you want to be able to identify are your hydrides. So look for some kind of an alkali metal combined with hydrogen okay, and reacting with water. Here it is. Lithium plus hydrogen are together forms are, right? So lithium is our um, alkali metal. Hydrogen is our, um, uh, what do you call it? Our, well, our hydrogen right? reacting in water. So when we put together the uh, reaction, right? and another way we can actually break this apart is, remember how we said about uh, when water, we're writing water, we write it down as HOH. So it's the metal combining with the non-metal over here. And then, well, we've got um, just the hydrogens. Remember, notice that hydrides, when they react with water, they produce hydrogen gas. So we know hydrogen gas is produced. And the other is lithium. lithium hydroxide and the lithium hydroxide is in an aqueous solution right because it's dissolved right in water so remember that the lithium even though we have the lithium the lithium dissociates itself within within water Double displacement reactions that produces hydrogen sulfide gas. Sulfides react with certain acids, such as hydrochloric acid, to produce hydrogen sulfide. So we treat hydrogen sulfide when, when putting together the formula. Hydrogen sulfide formula is as such. H2S. We use the same methods that we use in putting together ionic compounds. And we treat it like it's ionic, even though it's not in terms of the crossover rule to put together the hydrogen with the sulfur. So we have the following, potassium sulfide and hydrochloric acid. So we've got metal, non-metal, metal, non-metal. Non so we've got potassium combining with the chloride to give us KCl, the hydrogen combining with the sulfur to form our hydrogen sulfide. And hydrogen sulfide is in what state? Gas. Hydrogen sulfide is in gas form. Our KCl is aqueous. So, uh, and then for balancing, Make sure that your equations are balanced as well. So make sure, look over your balancing equations. Make sure you, you know how to write formulas. Make sure you know how to um, do the whole crossover rules. And make sure you know, obviously, your polyatomics. Double displacement reactions that produces sulfur dioxide gas. These types of double displacement reactions involve an additional decomposition reaction. So we've got sulfurous acid decomposes into sulfur dioxide 
and water. So H2SO3, when you see it in the product of your double displacement reaction, you will see that it will continue, it will further break down. So if you see it as one of the products, make sure you know to further that step. So we've got Na2, okay, so sodium um, sulfite, right, SO3 sulfite, plus two hydrochloric, uh, hydrochloric acid. So we've got metal, non-metal, metal, non-metal. Non so the metal is gonna combine with the non-metal, and we have uh, NaCl, right? NaCl and aqueous plus hydrogen with the sulfite to form H2SO3, right? Your sulfurous acid. But because we've got that, Right? Because we've got that, that further breaks down. Right? H2SO3 further decomposes into sulfur dioxide and water. So sulfur dioxide right, is, our, uh, is our gas, right? water, or liquid. But now, instead of writing... Right? So here is our double displacement reaction. But what happens is we don't end up writing that. Right? We decide to write this in its place. So we are going to form NaCl plus SO2, which is in a gas form, plus H2O, which is in a liquid form. So notice, as I said before, two reactants. Right? Normally form two products in double displacement reaction. But when you see this one, two, three products, you know there was a further decomposition reaction that must have occurred. So make sure that you can identify this sulfurous acid. So you might want to highlight that in your notes. That look for the, the uh, sulfurous acid in my uh, products because I know that in a double displacement reaction, so this is one of the, the little tricks, the little tips that you need to make sure you can remember. Double displacement reactions that produces carbon dioxide gas. Carbonates reacting with an acid produces carbonic acid. So here's another one of the ones that you're gonna have to remember. Carbonic acids decompose rapidly into carbon dioxide and water. So we've got sodium, metal, non-metal, metal, non-metal. Non right. So sodium is going to combine with the Cl, hydrogen with the CO3, the carbonate. So we're going to form NaCl, which is aqueous, plus carbonic acid which is also aqueous but remember as we said with the previous example this does not remain stable very long this will immediately react and decompose from H2CO3 into CO2 and water So the entire equation, right, the entire equation will include this as our, um, as one of the products. This product will actually further decompose into plus CO2 gas plus H2O liquid. So same thing, two reactants forming three products. Originally, we were forming two products, but you must be able to identify the carbonic acid. All right, so carbonic acid is one of them. The other one was sulfurous acid. Be able to identify those two because they further break down.
Double displacement reaction is that produces ammonia gas. Ammonia gas can be prepared uh, by a, the reaction of an ammonium salt with a base. Ammonium gas is very soluble in water and can be detected by its pungent, sharp smell. Ammonium hydroxide, so another one that you're going to have to be able to identify in your products. Ammonium hydroxide decomposes into ammonia, and just to remind you guys, ammonia is NH3. Right? And what state is it in? Okay. Ammonia gas. Plus water. So here we have ammonium chloride, so metal, non-metal, metal, non-metal. Non so the ammonium chloride, sorry, the ammonium is going to combine with the hydroxide, right? Ammonium hydroxide. The sodium is going to combine with the chloride. So we've got NaCl, and it's aqueous, plus the ammonium NH4OH. But we know, right, so we should be able to identify. So you got to take that time and learn and memorize some of these exceptions to the rule, where if you see that, that that ammonium hydroxide, right, which is aqueous, is going to further decompose into NH3 gas plus water. So, what we're going to not have is where we're going to have NaCl is going to form. We're going to form ammonium hydroxide, but it's not going to remain that way for very long because it's going to further decompose into your NH3 gas, your ammonia gas, plus your H2O liquid. Double displacement reactions that produces water. Typical reaction includes neutralization of an acid and a base. We've looked at this previously before, right? Combine an acid, right? hydrogens, base, hydroxides. Those are some of our hints. They're going to form a salt and a water. Right? So sulfuric acid plus sodium hydroxide produces sodium sulfate, which is our salt, plus or water. Right? So that's one type of uh, neutralization reaction. And then there are a few that don't look as obvious. Most metal oxides, so think of it this way, metal, any metal oxide are considered bases. Remember what, what were bases before? The hydroxide. Right? So now we're, we're going to identify the fact that we can have a metal combined with oxygen and it's considered a base. So when we see a metal oxide combined with an acid, right, similar neutralization reaction will occur. Right? So here's our acid, okay, nitric acid, combined with magnesium oxide. So that's going to react to form magnesium nitrate plus water. We're still forming our salt and our water. We have our acid. So if you see the acid, you see water in your process. So you're, look, you're looking for acid in the uh, reactants. You find we've got a water and an ionic compound in our products. Look for the fact that we have our metal oxide, any type of metal. So it's not necessarily that we have to have the hydroxide, as we've seen. So this is now a new exception to the neutralization rule. Another one is most metal, non-metal oxides. Right? Remember, if you go back to your types of reactions, right? so go back to the lesson on types of reactions. Look for the reaction that involves um, the formation of acids and bases. And we deal with this, this concept. The metal oxides and the non-metal oxides. So go back to that if you have to. 
and you'll, you'll, you'll see exactly what we're talking about. So now, non-metal oxides are acidic, and obviously if they're acidic, they're gonna, if they react with a base, okay, they will form a neutralization reaction as such. So here's one, carbon dioxide gas, considered acidic, combines with lithium hydroxide, which is our base. We're forming water, and here is our salt. So remember what we said? Look for either an acid or a base that are obvious to identify. Then look for water in your product. Then also look for the fact that you have an ionic compound. Odds are these will represent either an acid or a base. They're not all cut and dry like we've been taught before. So there are a few exceptions to the rule. Now, representing aqueous ionic reactions with net ionic equations. The reaction between silver nitrate and sodium chloride. So I've written out the, um, the actual equation. Now, I've left blanks here because I'm trying to figure out what kind of state. So well, for when we're doing such reactions, we need to be able to identify what is going to dissolve, what is it. Right? So to do that, I'm going to need my solubility chart. So we have Na, Na, soluble guideline one. So soluble and guideline one. We've got nitrate, which is over here. Also guideline number one, soluble. So it's aqueous. Silver chloride. We look for silver. There it is, and it says it's insoluble. And it's in guideline number two. We look for the chloride, and the chloride is soluble, but it's in guideline number three. So the higher guideline dictates its solubility. So is it soluble or insoluble? Insoluble. insoluble. So it's a solid. So that is the only thing. So now what we're looking at here is this is not going to dissolve. Or, or break apart. It's not going to dissociate in water. It will remain as that clump. This will. These will. Right? Anytime they're, you're mixed in aqueous, it means that the metal has dissociated itself from the non-metal to allow, let's say, the oxygen, which is slightly negative, to surround the silver. And for the nitrate, it allows the hydrogens which are slightly positive according to electronegativity to be attracted to the anion, the nitrate. And that's what's happening. And that's what we're going to be doing. We're actually going to be trying to write what we call net ionic equations. So we've got our regular equation. This is our typical chemical equation. What we're going to do is we're going to write it in what we call uh, ionic form. Now, in reality, soluble ionic compounds dissociate into their respective ions in solution. So, we've got the same equation. Right? So, we're just continuing from that equation. So, what we're going to do is we're going to dissociate. Right? So, go back to your lesson on dissociation. If you don't understand what I'm talking about. And what, what, we're, what dissociation mean, it means is the ionic compound breaks apart into your positives and your negatives. So, they break that break apart as follows. Ag, positive. Nitrate, which is negative. Na, so sodium, positive. Uh, chloride, negative. Notice all of them are aqueous. They're, they're, they, they re retain the same state that they're in. They're dissolved in water. So, because they're all aqueous, water is surrounding each and every single one of these. 
but it's the oxygen part of water that's surrounding the silver. It's going to do the same thing with the sodium, right? Because according to electronegativity, oxygen is slightly negative. The, uh, all the anions are going to have the hydrogen part, right? Because they're slightly positive, attracted to all the anions. Here are the anions, here are the cations. And notice what part of water is going to surround each and every single one of them. But notice, of all of them, which one isn't going to ionize or dissociate? Because it's the one that doesn't dissolve. Because it doesn't dissolve, it won't break apart. It will remain okay, as the compound itself. Even though, yes, I can ionize you know, silver, right? We've got it here ionized, in an ionized form. We can ionize chlorine. We've got it here in that form. But when they come together, because according to the solubility guideline, that will not dissolve. Right? Because it's insoluble. So, there are a few terms that we're going to look at. Something called spectator ions. The ion, and think about what a spectator is, right? If you're a spectator at a sporting event, you're just watching, right? So the ions in the solution that are not important are called spectator ions. So these are the ions that are, they're there, but really don't make any difference. Total ionic equations include all the ions that are involved with the reaction as well as the spectator ion. So what I have up here, what I have up here is what we call the total ionic. The total ionic includes everything, spectator ions and the ions that are responsible for um, the, the insoluble um, product. Now, we've got Ag, we've got NO3, NaCl in our products. What we want to do is we want to cross out the ions that appear on both sides. Which appear on both sides? Sodium and nitrate. So sodium with sodium, nitrate with nitrate. Those are the spectator ions. They're there just for the show. They're watching. Because the real reaction is the sodium ion and the chloride ion in aqueous solution that are coming together to form this insoluble product. So what we're forming is once we remove these spectator ions, this is what, we're call, what we call the net ionic uh, equation. So the net ionic equation is the final result. What are the ions that are responsible for forming this insoluble product? So we've got Ag positive, which is aqueous in solution combined with the Cl negative in an aqueous solution is going to form our insoluble product. So now, here are two terms you need to know, right? or three of them, I guess. Spectator ion, these are the ones that are just kind of watching the show. These are the ones we cross out. So we cross out spectator ions when we are trying to figure out what our net ionic equation is. But the total, total ionic equation includes everything, spectator ions and all. So make sure you know the difference. So be careful what a question asks you. Does it ask you for the net ionic equation or are you being asked for the total ionic equation where you include everything? and you dissociate everything. The only thing that doesn't dissociate, right, is the one that does not dissolve. Identifying ions in aqueous solutions. Chemists use mass spectrometers to help identify dissolved ions. Uh, so here we're going to just go into a little bit of theory um, that will help in a lab 
when, uh, when identifying certain precipitates. So you might have two unknowns that you mix together and using certain colors will help you determine um, what type of um, ions are actually present. So some chemists use something called a wet chemical technique to identify certain ions in solution. With this, each reaction, insoluble compounds precipitate out of the solution, allowing chemists to identify the ions in solution. This ion identification process is an example of what we call a qualitative analysis. So I'm going to show you guys a couple of charts. You don't have to memorize these, but just so you uh, to see them in terms of colors that actually can appear when you're dealing with these aqueous solutions, right? So depending on the type of ion that is present, will actually give off certain colors. Sometimes they help, sometimes you gotta do further tests to be able to identify um, some ions that might be in question because some ions actually display similar colors. Now, intensity of color varies with concentration of the ion in solution. We talked about concentration and how uh, mixtures can have variable composition. Right? The more solute you put in, you know, the more um, that has to be dissolved. And of course, we talked about dissolving and solubility and how temperature and size all play a role in, um, in whether or not, you know, how much of a, of a solute actually does dissolve in, uh, in solution. Now, some ions are colorless in aqueous solutions. Cations, so any of the metals that are in groups one and two, okay, when they lose their electron, Okay. including aluminum, zinc, and most anions are considered colorless. So if you're putting together something and you get something that's colorless, odds are you have one of these. So it's not going to be a great test to identify which one, you know, which ion is actually present. If they're colorless, it could be any one of these. So numerous ones, right? So that's why you got to go through, let's say, other um, tests to be able to identify the types of ions if you're not clear if you're not told, right? You're just given two mystery um, aqueous solutions that you were asked to mix together. So, the color of some common ions in aqueous solutions are as follows. If we've got chromium-2 and copper-2, we get the blue color. Chromium, copper, iron, and nickel. So we've got uh, chromium-3, copper-1, as opposed to copper-2, iron-2, uh, and nickel-2. All of them form the color green in aqueous solutions that we'll see. Uh, iron 3, pale yellow, cobalt 2, and manganese 2, both pink. Now, in terms of the ions, and somehow the heading got shifted here, we've got chromate, which will be yellow, dichromate, which will be orange, and permanganate, which will be purple. As I said, guys, do not memorize these. There's no need. Uh, the flame color of selected metallic ions are as such. So, you can do also flame tests. Right, and you've seen the flame test uh, if you came here for open house in grade eight, uh, where we uh, selected certain um, uh, metals and we pretty much introduced it to the Bunsen flame Bunsen burner. Lithium will turn red, sodium will turn yellow, potassium violet as well as cesium, calcium will turn red, strontium will turn red, barium will turn yellowish green, copper will turn bluish green, boron will turn green, Lead will turn bluish white. Uh, one of the ones that we've actually burned, right? Anyone remember which one we burned in the lab? We did it also in grade 10? What was it? Magnesium. What, did, what color did that turn? White. Okay. So these are ways to help you identify the, um, the types of metals that uh, we have in solution. And happy birthday, Priscilla. Thank you. Ooh, I didn't so happy birthday. Oh my god. I know. Priscilla, blow it out. Yeah, blow it out. I tried that before, it didn't work. No, it didn't work. There we go. <laughs>